Hi everyone, and welcome back to Tokyo on Fire. Today is October 17th, 2017. It wasn't but five months ago that my guest, Chris Blackerby from NASA was on the show. Welcome back, Chris. Thanks so much, Tim, it's great to be back. You've had a transition. Caroline Kennedy is no longer in the embassy as our ambassador. We have a new ambassador, William Haggerty, who is now in position. You were the NASA representative for five years at the embassy. And in fact, you received a scholarship to join NASA right out of college. You've been there for 15 or 16 years, right? Yeah, I actually got a fellowship out of graduate school uh, and I was with NASA for 15 years, 10 of which were in Washington, DC. And the last five, I was the NASA attache. How in Japan. How incredible. You know, in, on our show, Tokyo on Fire, we like to talk about upcoming hot political issues and an issue like, you know, the ones that you're working on are, are really topical to us. So, so I want to get right into the heart of the matter, if you don't mind. Let's talk about those aliens. Yeah, Tim, you know I can't talk to you about that here. <laughs> Maybe off camera later. Is that okay? Yeah. You must get this all the time. You're at NASA. NASA is doing all of this wonderful stuff there at the, the pinnacle of, of technology and space development. And you must get peppered with these kind of um, serious questions all the time. I did. Well, when I was at NASA, as you mentioned, I've transitioned outside of NASA. But yes, when I was there, we'd get the questions. Every single presentation I did, mm -hmm. the question of aliens came up. And of course, we don't know. We okay. don't have any evidence of it. But the universe is huge. It'd be hard to believe that, that there's not something else out there. Right. Yeah. yeah. Well, it's a scary thought to think um, maybe if we're not. Yeah, well, that's what we, we've talked about, right? It's a, there, there's two possibilities. Either, either we're alone in this universe or we're not, and, and either, either option is equally scary. Right. <laughs> well, it's pretty scary sitting here with you. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for coming on the show again. So you're in a new gig now. You are AstroScale. It's a KK that was set up a couple of years ago in Singapore. It's now a KK here in Japan. It's, it's basically a startup in a new technology in a new field, isn't it? Yeah, so you know, it's a really exciting time in space overall. So when I was with NASA, I did government work for 15 years, right, working on space policy and, and space development. But I always kept aware of what was going on on the industry side. Mm -hmm. And we all know the big players, you know, the Lockheed Martins and Boeings and, and Airbus, all the big industry players in Japan, MHI, IHI, Melco. But what's happening now is a real, uh, uh, in, an incredible time of startups in space. And so again, you've heard of the big ones in the US, you've heard of SpaceX, or you've heard of Blue Origin, a Jeff Bezos company, or, or, or Virgin Galactic. But there's a, there's, a, there's a group in Japan that's happening now too, all doing different stuff. And so the company that I'm now uh, COO of, Astroscale, uh, started in Singapore, as you mentioned. Two years ago, we opened an office in Japan. Our mission is to uh, clean up space debris and maintain a sustainable orbital environment. Okay. And why is that important? I mean, I've seen uh, maps and it, it's kind of disconcerting because they qualify space debris as a, as a dot, so the world is kind of surrounded by these dots. Some of them are small and some of them are large, but it, it looks really uh, crowded out there. It is crowded. And those maps are a little bit, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's not a totally accurate because as you say, it looks like a little dot, so it looks like we're totally encompassed in space trash. And that's not so much the case, but it is, growing, the amount of debris that's up there now, hundreds of thousands of pieces of space debris uh, between one centimeter and all the way up to rocket bodies. Uh, in, in terms of the, the debris we can really measure that can do real damage 10 centimeters mm -hmm. and greater, uh, you know, tens of thousands of pieces of space debris. So the orbital environment is getting more and more congested and the more pieces of debris that are up there, the more possibility is that there's an accident that causes a, a, a devastation to a satellite or to something like the space station. I guess there's no international convention about if you're gonna put it up there, it's your responsibility to bring it down. Sometimes they put it up there and it'll come down, but give it 100 years or so, right? So there's a generally accepted practice that if you're gonna launch something, it needs to come down within 25 years. Okay. That's the general idea. and. That's people now becoming more responsible in space. When we first started, they didn't really think about it, but now that it's becoming so congested, people are more responsible. Um, but that doesn't always happen. Mm -hmm. Sometimes uh, an accident happens and there's, there's debris that's stuck in space for tens or hundreds of years potentially. Uh, and there's no real enforcement mechanism. Right. So there's UN bodies that focus on this, or there's intergovernmental agencies, uh, you know, groups that focus on this, where different space agencies are apart. But there's no policeman of the skies that's up there, you know, pulling people over for leaving too much debris <laughs> in, in an orbital plane. So 
Uh, it makes it tough. The regulatory question is is a difficult one, and that's one of the few, one of the several that we're working on as a as a company. Do we have the ability to actually look up and map out and see almost all of the the significant pieces that are there, or maybe even the insignificant pieces? We we can. We can see okay. a lot of them. And there's you know these are these are ground based antenna that are looking up, and there's companies and there's government agencies that are looking up. Japan doing it as well as the U.S. as well as Europe. Uh, I was just in Australia for a conference. They have a, a group that's looking up and tracking it. So there's a variety of places that are tracking it. Um, but we, first of all, can't get a totally comprehensive picture. And in fact, our company, one of the first missions that we're going to be launching later this year is going to be tracking micro debris, sub -mil millimeter debris in space. And we're going to be launching wow. a, a mission that's going to track that in low Earth orbit to try to get us a, an in situ map. Mm -hmm. of, of what's happening up there. So as long as it's traveling in a constant speed that keeps it in orbit, it's probably okay. And as that orbit gets closer to the Earth, it just needs to be traveling faster to stay there. But eventually, is it accurate to say all of this stuff will fall to the Earth? Everything that's up there eventually will, well, at certain levels, it depends on where you are. Uh, you know, if we go to an extreme, the moon is not falling to the Earth, right? And that's orbiting the Earth, but it's not falling. Mm -hmm. But most of those satellites in low Earth orbit, they're constantly falling. But it takes a lot of time for it to come down right. on the order of, of hundreds of years, potentially, when you're looking at orbits in the 1,000 to 1,500 kilometer range. How do you get uh, from the big stuff to the small stuff? Why is there so much small stuff up there? A variety of reasons. So some of them are accidents in the past. There have been collisions between satellites uh, that have hit, and they've created lots of pieces of tiny debris. Dead satellites, or this is just... Most recent example, one of the more recent examples, a more famous example, was a active satellite hitting a dead uh, Russian satellite. And they collided and created thousands of pieces of space debris from very small, tiny pieces to much larger. And what else could be up there? It could be anything. It could be a little piece of, uh, of a satellite that fell off. Uh, it could be someone on the space station dropped something, and there's a screw literally in orbit. The, it it's, it's, could be anything like that. Mm -hmm. So um, there's a lot of ways that that kind of small debris could be created. And, and, and that can still do damage. Even that small debris can do damage when it's traveling at 17,500 right. miles an hour, which is what it's doing in low Earth orbit. It can create significant damage. Well, isn't the space station also hit uh, on on a regular basis by debris? It is. The space station has to move up and down to avoid any conjunction or accident. And and there's pictures that astronauts have taken of small pieces that have hit the glass, uh, kind of like you're driving on the on the road and a little pebble comes and hits your windshield, and you can see the divot in the windshield. Mm -hmm. There are those pictures up there, and then it has to be repaired. Uh, so. Debris is a constant problem. It's a problem for the several people that are in space on the space station, and it's a problem for the many active satellites that every country in the world has in orbit right now that basically helps us in our daily life without right. even knowing it. You mentioned this satellite that was uh, that crashed into a, a dead Soviet satellite. They knew that was going to happen. They they had preparation for it. Did it just kind of happen? In that case, it just happened. Usually, there's the on the ground warnings can be provided called conjunction analysis that can say, hey, we know that in a certain amount of time you are going to cross paths with another satellite. You better move it up or down. Mm -hmm. uh, so that can be done, but you know, human error, technical error, things happen, uh, and the more satellites that are in orbit the more possibility there is that there's going to be some kind of accident. And what we're at right now in terms of space development, we're on the cusp of an incredible jump in terms of numbers of satellites that are going to be launched. Because it's not just governments that are doing it. It's not just governments anymore. And it's not just big companies anymore. Uh, there's been a democratization of mm -hmm. space, basically. So universities and small companies and so many are being able to launch satellites that used to be you know, the size of this room, huge. Right. Uh, and now there can be these things called CubeSats, which are can fit in my hand. And so all of these satellites are up in orbit, and that's great because it's providing us information on weather, on communications, uh, on, uh, you know, for security purposes. There's so many uses of satellites. Literally every single day we rely on satellites to right. talk to our family or friends, to get what the weather is, to understand directions, to get somewhere. All of that is based on satellites. And so there's lots of companies now that are able to do satellite launches for a much cheaper price than they used to. They're able to build satellites that are smaller and less expensive. So there's a lot more that are being built. Subsequently, a lot more are going to be launched. And as a consequence of that, 
the projection is, the, the number of um, inert space objects it is grow. just going to... It will grow. Right. I mean, it's just, it, 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 just, it just stands to reason. As you go out from that and as you create more uh, satellites that are providing positive good, some of those satellites are going to fail. Right. Uh, and so what we think is that some of these major, they're called constellations, they're going to be called mega constellations of satellites. There's companies that are planning to launch 500, 1,000, 1,500 satellites in the next five or 10 years that will provide, in some cases, wireless communication globally. So you could be in the middle of Africa, you could be in a, an urban canyon in Tokyo, you'll have a wireless capability. That's what this company, one company called OneWeb, is trying to do. So they're going to be launching these hundreds of satellites. Estimates are maybe 5 to 10 percent will fail before the okay. end of their lifetime. They need a way to, to come down. They need to be removed as soon as possible to remove that potential danger to the constellation. And so that's what we'd like to help with. In that kind of a, um, a business model, I understand that they're having a service, they're selling a service, they're generating a revenue. What's the deal with your company? I mean, who is benefiting from you? Um, wh where's the revenue model? So uh, in terms of the benefit, of course, I mean, I know this isn't really along the business line, but we're all benefiting. Whenever sure. we can remove a piece of debris from orbit, whenever we can make sure that an additional piece of debris is not added to orbit, we're all benefiting. Mm -hmm. Our children, generations are benefiting by cleaning up that environment. Now, on the more near-term business case, we think that there is the benefit for that company in that they remove that potential risk from orbit. Any time that there is something in space that is uncontrolled and is not being utilized, that's a risk to everybody else in space. And so if we can provide that service, it's almost an, an insurance and, and an assurance that your orbit will remain sustainable. Mm -hmm. And so if we can do that, that's great. I mean, if, if, if somebody is, uh, if you're driving on a highway and a car breaks down and it sits on the side of the road, that is a potential hazard for any other car that drives by. So you'd want to remove that hazard from there. Now, that's kind of what we're doing. We mm -hmm. want to go up there and help to remove that hazard from there. So our near-term model is we want to uh, provide an end-of-life service for these missions. Bring the satellites that are launched, bring them back down. So it's like an insurance. So you, you would uh, appeal to the companies who are launching and you'll say, we'll take care of it at end of life. You're gonna pay us a couple of bucks for that and that's part of our business model. Yeah, and, 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 we're, and we're talking to a variety of different paths and we're talking to the regulators, mm -hmm. the international and the national regulators. We're talking to these companies that are launching these mega constellations. Right. We're talking to the insurance providers and saying, hey look, work with us on this because we can make it so there's less of a risk. It's a risk reward situation. Mm -hmm. And with the, the, the additional thousands of satellites that will be launched in the next few years, the risk is just gonna continue to increase. So mm -hmm. there is a business case for this. There is a reason why these companies should want to do this. But there's also just a responsibility case. Mm -hmm. um, in the 50s and 60s, uh, you know, chemical companies might have dumped their waste into a river, right. and the logic was, oh, ocean's huge. Mm -hmm. You might have to worry about one river, right? Come on, it's not going to be able to do that much damage. Right. That kind of argument is ridiculous. A now, pollution right? of the commons. Yeah, that's, and that, that's what it was, right. and that's what's happening in, in space. And so the responsible companies that are launching these thousands of satellites recognize that, mm -hmm. and they want to be a part of the solution. And so um, they recognize that it's good for their business, it's good for sustaining their orbit, but they also recognize that it's just the right thing to do. But it's gotta be expensive too. Yeah, well we're working on that. Yeah. <laughs> so we're hoping that we can... Because uh, it, it, it's, a, it's a big ocean, right? It's a big ocean and getting up there is difficult. The launches are still expensive. Um, you know, so even with, the, there's a proliferation of inexpensive launches out there now before you just have the big guys, the MHIs, right? right? Um, uh, but there's a lot of small launches, on-demand launchers that are that are coming around, and so it's getting cheaper, but it's still expensive, and so uh, it's it's still a tough thing to do. But we're hoping that by scaling it up, by initial success that we're hoping to have on our first technology demonstration mission, which will be in a couple of years, we're hoping that by showing that we can scale up, we can provide the service to a lot of people. It can be cheaper, and and we can provide, we can become a standard. We're right. When I first heard of this venture, AstroScale. I thought it was um, somehow related to going up into space and vacuuming all of these, the, the debris that's there. And that's not really the business model. It is, you, you're gonna be launching, you have a liability, you have a responsibility, we're gonna, we're gonna help you cover that liability, right? So William, when you're talking about debris, you're gonna look at two different things, and I mentioned this just a second ago, but you're gonna be looking at not adding any debris to the current situation, 
and removing the debris that's already there. So what we're focused on first is that first section, and then we're calling that end-of-life services. So when you launch a satellite, we're going to be up there to make sure it comes down and it doesn't impact anybody Manned, else. unmanned, it's, it's undecided yet. Unmanned. Okay. Unmanned. So launching satellites for, um, yeah, like a, a, any kind of Earth observation, communication satellite, we'll make sure that that comes down. That's the end-of-life service. The act of debris removal is what you, is what you mentioned just right. now, going up there and finding it and taking it down. Now, what's the technology to do that? There's it's a lot not of, even created yet, no, is it? it's not. Right. There's a lot of ideas out there, and they're pretty cool. So there's, uh, there's harpoons, there's, there's magnets, there's adhesives. In fact, when this company started, Astroscale, we were looking at using an adhesive. And mm -hmm. the first thought was we would use an adhesive, and we would do the ADR, the active debris removal. Go up and find something, stick to it with an adhesive, and then bring that down. Mm -hmm. The business model was a little bit difficult there. The advent of these mega constellations provided us an alternate route for that. So that's why we've shifted a bit. But we haven't abandoned mm -hmm. the adhesive route. We haven't abandoned the active debris removal side. So we are doing a couple different tracks right now. One is we're working on the technology for this EOL service, right. end of life service. But we're also continuing to focus on what kind of ADR, active debris removal possibilities uh, might be out there. So we're researching that as well. Besides having you working in the company, what competitive advantage do they have <laughs> here? Why Japan? Why, why now? Why in this geography? So the, the founder, the CEO, is a Japanese uh, citizen. Uh, he's based in Singapore, and so he started the company there in Singapore. But of course, he has this connection to Japan, and so opened an R&D office, which is here in Tokyo, uh, and opened that a couple years ago, two and a half years ago. And so Japan obviously has a proliferation of experts. Uh, there's a lot of smart people here. Japan is one of the top spacefaring countries in the world. So a lot of our staff is mixed into two bands. There's a lot of experienced engineers who used to work for space companies, right. and they've, they've retired and they want to do something exciting, so they've come over to provide their experience and their expertise. And then there's a lot of young graduates, 25 to 35. And want Japan, to be on something new. Yeah, something yeah. new and exciting and game-changing. I mean, yeah. when you're looking at something that's going to impact decades, centuries, that's the kind of work we're doing. And so these kids are coming in there and they're saying, I, I don't want to just go work for the big companies. I, I want to go do something that's going to really make a difference and that I can be part of a startup culture. And that's what we, that's what we provide. Right. Astro Scales, Chris Blackerby, talking about aliens and space debris. Please continue to stay tuned. This is a really emerging topic.